the first thing we want to discuss in this chapter is nth root. And we're going to be dealing with radical expressions and radicals, and that's exactly what this is right here. This is called a radical expression. It has a radical bar, which is here. It has an index n, and on the inside it has what's called a radicand. So let me label all that. This is a radical expression. n is the index, and a is the radicand. And this is a radical expression. If I wanted to find the nth root of a, well, what, what does that mean? What would I be looking for? So if I'm looking to find the nth root of a, what I'm looking for is, let's say, let me just write out that the nth root of a, let's say that that is b. Well, what does that mean? If I find the nth root of a and it's equal to b, how is b related to this expression over here? Well, if the nth root of a is b, that's telling you that b raised to the power of the index, which is n, gives you a. Those two statements. This is very important. The nth root of a is equal to some number if we can raise that number to the index and get what's inside. And I know that's a very general statement, and it doesn't really make much sense, but I think once we see some see some examples it might help. So let's do one example over here. Let's do the square root of 16. Now usually it's pretty known that the square root of 16 is equal to 4. But why is it equal to 4? What's the square root of 16? We know that this is equal to 4 just by working with perfect squares. The reason the square root of 16 is equal to 4 is because if you take 4 and you raise it to the power of the index, which in this case is 2, what do you get? You get 16. So that's why the square root of 16 is equal to 4, because 4 to the second power is 16. Let's do another example. Let's do the third root of 27. We want some number. We don't know what it is, so maybe I'll write that this way. This is going to be equal to some number. We don't know what it is. But we do know that this number, whatever it is, when we raise it to the third power, it's going to be equal to 27. So whatever this is, we know that if it satisfies this, that if we take this number, raise it to the third power, we're going to get what's on the inside. So what number is that? We could have 1 times 1 times 1. If we plugged 1 in here, it would be 1 to the third power. That doesn't work. 2 to the third power is 2 times 2 times 2. That's 8. Uh, that doesn't work. 3 to the third power is 3 times 3 is 9 times another 3 is 27. So that's what it is. We're talking about 3. So the cube root of 27 is, in fact, I can't erase that. I can make it look like a 3. There we go. It's 3. And the reason why? Because 3 cubed gives us 27. Taking this another step forward, when we're taking a certain root, a third root, or a fifth root, or a seventh root, whatever sort of root we're taking, if we're taking that and we also have an exponent involved, so for this first example, we have the third root of 5 to the third Notice you see that the index and the exponent both match. So let's think about what this means. Well, if this was equal to something, we want to know what this is equal to. And we know that whatever this is equal to, the third root of 5 to the third, we know when we take this and we raise it to the power of the index, which is 3, so whenever I take this and raise it to a power of 3, I'm going to get what's inside my radicand, which is 5 to the third. So, let's look at this, this statement. What The third root of 5 to the third, that's equal to some number. But then when I take that some number, whatever I get, and I raise it to the index, or raise to a power of 3, I should get 5 to the third. So what does this number have to be in order to satisfy this equation? 
well, they have the, these are equal, but they have the same exponents, this number has to be 5. And that's what happens here. We get that our whole expression here is 5. So, let me write down here, the third root of 5 to the third is equal to 5. That is what we're looking for. And it turns out that roots and exponents have a very, very interesting relationship. So these roots and these exponents have a relationship. And you're going to be able to see this in a future podcast when I talk about rational exponents. But right now, we're just going to see what happens if this always happens, that the second root and the second power here, do they kind of cancel each other out? So in this next example, we need to find the second root of, of 7 squared. Well, actually, let's do a different approach. Let's write, um, let's simplify what's inside. The square root of 7 squared is 49. What is the square root of 49? Well, that would be 7. So in both cases here, we took these cube root of 5 to the third, and we got 5. Then we took the square root of 7 squared, and we got 7. So it looks like these indices are canceling out with these exponents. So can we come up with a rule? And, chan and the fact is, yes, we can. When we have, and it actually matters here, what our index is. When we have an expression, x to the n, and we're taking the nth root of that, some number raised to the nth power gives us x to the n. Well, it has to be x. Same thing down here. Well, this is equal to x when n is odd. When n is odd. So we can kind of just have, don't have to really worry about things. The nth root of x to the n that's just equal to x. They kind of cancel each other out, but that happens when n is odd and only when the index and the exponent match and they're odd. When they're even, we can know that's what's coming. So when n is even, it's not quite, not quite the same thing. It's actually going to be the absolute value of x. So what I'd like to do on the next page is explain why that's the case. Okay, to illustrate this point and to hopefully reinforce some ideas in this chapter, I have two sets of problems here that hopefully you'll be able to see a connection between. First, if we look at this problem up here, and I'm going to ask you to find the cube root of negative 64. Well, we can take, we're allowed to take the cube root of a negative number. That's allowed. We cannot take the square root of a negative number because we'd never be able to find this number once we square it to get a negative number. At least not yet. That's to come. But to get the cube root of negative 64, we're looking for some number, some number to the third power, so that's equal to negative 64. And it turns out that the cube root of negative 64 is negative 4. So the solution to this particular cube root, right? so this is equal to the cube root of negative 64. Good. Now down below here to the next example, we kind of just saw this on that last page. When you have an index of 3 and an exponent of 3, we see that when you take the nth root of some number or variable to that same index, but it's a power, they kind of cancel each other out, and you're left with what's inside, which in this case, and the rule that we had was, remember, the nth root of x to the n was equal to x. So in this particular case, we have the third root of negative 4 to the third power. That's going to be equal to, when they undo each other, we get negative 4. Good. Now, that's the top part. Down below here, that's, and that will usually and almost always be the case, when we have the index and the exponent that are odd. Odd index. Okay? 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. Odd index. When we don't have an odd index, we have to be a little bit more careful. 
So here we have even indices here, right? When you don't have one, when you don't have an index shown, you know that's a, an index of two. Let's simplify both of these. So what is the square root of 49? Some number squared that gives you 49. Well, we know that that number is going to be equal to 7. So the square root of 49 is equal to 7. We know that if you were to square negative 7, you also get 49. So this, what's in the question mark here could be in parentheses negative 7. But in fact, when we're taking the principal root of something, when you're taking the principal root of an integer, you want, to, want it to equal a positive number. So the square root will always, with an even index, the square root, some sort of index with, um, that is even, of a positive number will result in a positive number. You also should not, right now, be able to do even indices with negative radicands. And that's to be discussed later. But my point here is 49, when you take the square root of that, you get 7. What about down here? Well, let's simplify what's inside first. Well, we can, if we, actually, if we look back here and use this same rule, that the nth root of x to the n is just x, then this, if you just look at that, we would say, oh, wait, well, they cancel each other out. We're going to get, and this is a question mark, we're going to get negative 7. Well, let's see if that's the case. Down below here, let's simplify it. We're going to have the square root. Negative 7 squared is 49. Well, we just did that. We saw that that was equal to 7. So just right here, if you want to look at the, indis the index and the exponent and think they cancel each other out and you're left with whatever is inside, you would get the wrong answer. The right answer is 7, but if you did this incorrectly, you would see, you would write negative 7. This is why when you have n, and let me erase that, I'm going to use a different color. When you have the nth root of x to the n, and n is even, this is going to be equal to the absolute value of x. So in this particular case, this is not going to be equal to negative 7. It's going to be the absolute value of negative 7, which we know to be 7. So you just have to be careful. When the index matches the exponent on the inside, and we're talking about variables, you're raising a variable to an exponent, and you're also taking the root, and it's the same, same number, you have to be careful. You can't just cancel it out and say x or 4, or 7, or whatever it may be. You have to be careful and notice whether or not the index and the exponent are even. Because if it's even, we need to make sure that our result is a positive number. And that's why we have absolute value of x.